Nice. Okay, so um, yeah, this talk is going to be about um, administrative data model requirements as they do not only exist in the European Union, but actually in Switzerland as well. And we've had quite a long history with all sorts of uh, administrative data model requirements. So we thought we could just come here and take the opportunity to speak in front of some people from the European Union um, to see like what your um, experiences are and what our experiences are and what maybe we can learn from each other. So about me, I'm, um, I'm an application engineer, I'm a geographer, I do quite a bit of QGIS development and um, I have my company in Switzerland, which is OpenGIS, and um, this is basically our company. As you see, we're all based in Switzerland, and that's why we also like have our main focus there. And I'm very happy to be here today with Stefan Ziegler, who is a surveyor in Switzerland. He's in one of the cantons of the regions of Switzerland, managing their um, Geo data ecosystem and infrastructure, who will be presenting you a use case and kind of the challenges he faces in everyday life at work with their, with their infrastructure and how they solved it. And uh, besides that, he's a cycling enthusiast. I thought I'd put that here too. We, need, we, needed, to, we needed to fill one bullet, so it's just. Just to be complete. <laughs> Have a structured, modelized approach. That's what we like. Um, so why do we do we have data model requirements? A lot, a big question we have behind the data model requirements is that we want to have harmonized data in the end. And harmonized data, the requirement from that very often comes just from like um, decision making is a lot easier, is a lot better, is actually a lot more accurate if you have uh, data that you can rely on. And if you don't have data that just comes for any, from anywhere in some like slightly different formats with slightly different meanings, you never really know what you're gonna get, you never really know what you're gonna, what you're gonna judge and how you're gonna unify them all. Um, so for example, I recently um, had re, um, a conversation with someone from Austria and they had um, uh, some high water on the Rhine and they had to quite quickly react in this emergency situation because like it was just raining hard and um, apparently the data set that they got from both sides of the border one was just like 20 centimeter higher than the other one and this was basically brought in by different requirements um, on the data model already. So that's um, one of the very good reasons why you should just like think before, prepare your data at, in time to be prepared for the event when you need it quickly and you don't have any time to react into for such a situation. One more big advantage of using harmonized, like standardized data is interoperability. So if you keep your data in some standard sort of way, you can then also easily switch the system, which means kind of you avoid uh, vendor lock-in into a particular system and vendor. Um, but all in all, it's uh, pretty much a, a top-down approach, um, which we're gonna see later. So basically what we're trying in general with all sorts of um, Inspire and in Switzerland we have a system called Interlist, which is basically a very similar concept, is uh, when we try to harmonize data is we're trying to not all, uh, we try to swim all into the right direction like the orange fishes do and not have a green one just swimming somewhere else. Um, here's a quick comparison of how this works in the European Union and in Switzerland. So, uh, this is the top-down approach, which I was mentioning. So basically, we mostly need it on the upper level. That's where we get the data from everywhere, and we need to aggregate it. Um, so this is the, the organizations that benefit from harmonized data, that benefit from this whole approach. Whereas the one who actually do it and do this kind of harmonizations, they are all the countries, they are um, all the cantons, the regions in Switzerland. So these are the ones who need to uh, comply with these models. And maybe it's even further pushed down to like sub-regions or um, engineering offices or whoever. So in the end, the one who does it is not the one who needs it, which makes the incentive for those who do it quite low to actually come up with the data because the direct benefit is not there or 
maybe just um, a lot later. This, this is basically where a concept meets reality. So you have this super nice concept of a sliding, uh, nicely drifting, um, interlace harmonized, inspire harmonized data model. Whereas in reality, the risk is just quite big that you're going to crash it somewhere because you don't have the required incentives for uh, people to meet up with all the nice requirements that someone came up with. So, as a data pro producer, how do we get there? There's basically two approaches that we can follow to fill in the gaps, to fill in the data. So either we can record into one system where we have nicely built um, tools, or we can directly record inside the model that was defined by someone else, by some authority, and directly um, record, record into this model. So the first one, the record and transform one, is uh, normally when we have a purpose-specific tool for, with a separate data model that is different from the data model that we'll have in the end. Um, it's, but on the other hand, this is very, can be very well optimized with workflows and use cases, filling in some data here and here and here and here. And in the end, there is always going to be like one step where we need to take this data, which is in one model, and transform it to the final transfer model, which we are supposed to hand in at um, our upper administration level. Um, this means that also, like if we go this path, um, we need to continuously, continuously maintain um, these ETL tools to um, convert all the data from one to the other models if there is an update for, uh, for, the, for the basic tool that we use. And there is not always going to be a one-to-one -one matching on what our tool produces and what is expected from us to hand in. On the other hand, very often if we, have, we already have existing data, then it's very easy um, to just do that and we don't want to build completely new workflows. On the other hand, there is a second approach, which is directly record into the model, which would mean like we just take the data model as it comes to us from outside, and we just take the data model and use it as is and build our tools on top of that, which means we just save, the, we save ourselves from having the final step of the transformation. We just don't do any ETL at all, um, which means that it's very often lower initial cost with some tools I'm going to sh show you later and uh, the guarantee that the data and the model that they match 100%. However, this sounds very good, but it's really one of the concept versus reality things because um, these models need to be recording friendly. If they're like very heavily normalized, they're, they're gonna be like plenty of classes everywhere, which makes it very hard to record directly into them. And this is like one of the one of the key lessons that are being discussed in, or, or key questions that are being discussed in Switzerland right now is like to what degree do we define our data models as being like strict transfer data models, fully normalized and um, pleasant to look at from a data modeling perspective, and to what degree do we actually modelize our models in a way that we can work with them in everyday life? Um, so this is just two different concepts which we're going to think, we need to think about, um, or, or like some, some uh, governments who imply this, they need to think about how to, how to work with that. Um, we've built a whole tool chain for, uh, for Interlis, uh, which is based mainly around uh, QGIS and PostGIS. And um, on top of these, we have two other tools. One is called ILI2DB, and the other one is QGIS Model Baker. So ILI2DB was first developed, and what it does is it takes an interlist model and just creates a one-to-one -one mapping to this model in a Postgres database. It also handles GeoPackage and MSSQL and Oracle and whatever, uh, like can some other um, database backends, but we mostly use it with Postgres because we love Postgres. Um, and um, then we also developed something called QGIS Model Baker, which is just one step closer to the user. So ILI2DB is a low-level technical tool that lets you transform a model into a database, whereas QGIS Model Baker is actually taking information from that model and makes a lot more out of this information um, to, mark, to come up with nice user interfaces that you can use to enter data. So here's a small example. As Jody said before, at Phosphor G, you're allowed to show some code, so that's going to be my code slide. 
And I'm going to read some part of it because I am that cool, but Jody is no longer here to hear that. <laughs> um, no, basically, um, this defines um, um, a class called human being, person. And this class has some attributes like name and um, marriage status and um, sex and um, birth date and color, etc. And they are all quite strongly defined already in the model with data types like string or integer, with um, like minimum and maximum values, with like if they're a date, with like if this is um, the, the color of their hair, for example, is like bro blonde brown, black or red. And, there's like these enumeration values, a lot of things that we know from databases already that we can take there. But the interlist has a lot more in the end than, than, than pure databases. So there's even quite more things that we can specify inside the model, which Huge's model baker then takes and is able to produce for us nice forms, which um, are able to, which are able to um, create here, for example, some uh, orange uh, warnings if, if some fields need to be filled in, if uh, there is a date, it will, sh it will already uh, put a date there and so on. And for that it uses all QG's internal functionality pretty much only um, for this. So there is also a lot of QG's core development we've been doing just improving the forms to come up with this. So this means that we are able to create this kind of user interfaces directly from a model, uh, but it's not necessarily mm, the best thing to do with every model. So there is like this super basic requirements of like we have one layer and we just need to fill in some data there where it may be suitable, but on the other hand, you're also quite quick just like loading this layer, doing whatever you want to it yourself in your favorite GIS system and then deliver it to somewhere else. Whereas, like for the, um, um, we have quite a couple of topics. You know how many models we have in Switzerland currently to fill in? Mm, uh, 150, okay, 150, 200, so something. Okay, yeah. so, so quite a reasonable amount of data models that everyone needs to fill in. All the cantons need to fill in, and lots of them are like semi-complex ones, which are just like work to get it into it, but not something you would spend money on to develop a whole system to work with. So for this kind of this like the, 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 the basic target of models that we were, were, were that we were focusing with this project where it's very suitable to just quickly get things done. And then there is also the, the big models which are definitely too complex for what we're doing because they are um, they have some specific workflows attached to them which we need to somehow get right and which involve things that we cannot get out of the model. So for this kind of things, it can, ha, can just act as a basis. So there is a one, one project, for example, about the cadaster and land administration, which we collaborate with in Colombia. And they were just taking this model baker project as a basis, on top of which they built their more complex workflow. So they used model baker to create lots and lots of forms, like basic forms, whereas they, were, they are still, uh, um, additionally to this, developing some Python code for all the workflows they need on top of that. Um, now I'm handing over to, uh -huh. now I'm glad to hand over to Stefan Ziegler to tell you how he manages or not manages to not crash or crash the system in the real world. Thank you, Matthias. <laughs> We heard all this lovely concept, some kind of academic, but does it really work in reality? And long story short, uh, yes, we wouldn't be here, of course. Thanks. Uh, Matthias asked me uh, to tell you something about really a real world examples of how we use the so-called model-based approach, approach with Intellis and its really powerful tool sets like QGIS and its uh, lovely model-based plugin. So since we don't have a lot of time, we needed to focus on one real example. And we did choose the PLR cadastre. And the PLR sounds exotic. It's a shortcut for uh, have to look at public law restriction on land ownership. So the cadastre provides information about the most important public law restriction on real estates or on land ownership. So uh, it tells you or it provides information 
uh, how many stories you're allowed to build on your, if you want to build a house. So you're not allowed to build a 10-story house everywhere. So, or you need to clean um, or exchange the soil, the ground of your real estate because it's polluted. So this is the content of the PLR cadastre. Uh, technically, the PLR cadastre, it's, it's all about dealing with data from completely different topics and completely or, or different data providers from all uh, the three administrative levels in Switzerland. So it's, it, it, it sounds, first it sounds really complex, but at the end it's not that complex. But at the end of the day, we as a canton, can just, we must provide, or every of the 26 cantons must provide a web portal, so that includes some basic web mapping application, quite easy, and some services including WMS and some custom one, uh, so-called data extract service. Uh, yeah, and therefore, therefore we must uh, acquire the data from the three uh, levels and uh, from all topics. And uh, yeah, how we do this? Matthias, your favorite format, shapefile. Shall we do this with shapefile? No. <laughs> <laughs> and there's really one easy solution for this, and uh, this is Interlis. Uh, all the 17 different topics can be described in one single data model. So uh, uh, if we can, if we're able to, to describe the 17 topics in one data model, the data provider providers must be able to, the, to deliver the data, to provide the data in, in this data model and in one exchange format, in the so-called Intelis exchange format, which is basically XML. And uh, yeah, and we must, we as a SDI provider then, uh, must be able to, to import the data into our Postgres database and so on. And thanks to a fantastic Intelis tool chain, uh, this is actually, from my point of view, a no-brainer. Uh, Matthias already told we use ili 2 pg which is a part of the ili 2 db family. Norman is Norman. PG means Postgres or Postgres. Uh, we gather all the data from the data providers and use ili 2 pg to import into the database. But before we import the data, we use ELI Validator to validate uh, the data against the, the, the Intelis data model. And uh, this is a generic, this is really important to know, this is a generic uh, validator. So it must be written once, coded once, the ELI Validator, and you just uh, can validate every data against every Intelis data model. So it's really nice. Yeah, and so it's the, the data acquisition and importing stuff is, is really easy for us. But we as a canton are not only uh, uh, data acquisition, but we also must provide some data in, in our, uh, uh, from, from one of these different topics, we must provide the data ourselves. So there we use the QGIS uh, with, the, with the Model Maker plugin and and we export the data also with PG, and we are on the same processing line like every other topic, so it's really easy. And I think, uh, as I mentioned before, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer with a lot of benefits like high, high data quality, like data, like, like process automation, et cetera, et cetera. So I really love it, and it's, it's quite nice. So, <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> Are you trying to take over <laughs> my room? <laughs> so, thank you uh, for the presentation. Are there any questions in the audience? We have uh, time for that. Yes. Uh, 
sorry, maybe it will be a silly question, but did I properly understood that the, the plan with this uh, form builder is uh, to allow the data producers in that sense to faster and easier collect the data which will be inspired or SDI compliant? And then second question, till you decide, uh, was it, uh, I, I'm quite curious. Can you let them answer the first one? Yeah, you want to answer first? Um, can you, I think the it's question, cool. if I understood it correctly, the question was if it's easier for people to produce data. No, or? sorry, the question was whether the main point of this form builder is to create the environment where someone responsible for data collection can use QGIS, for example, to collect the new data, which will be stored in the structure which is already Inspire compliant or SDI compliant. I think you have pretty much gotten the point of the whole presentation Perfect. and summarized. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes it's good next, to next confirm. <laughs> and the second question is uh, based on the interaction with the stakeholders in your country and the cantons, was it difficult to convince them to to go to that direction because I'm coming from Slovakia where we have completely opposite scenario that majority of the data providers, they insist on their existing data structures and somehow because of some legal requirements, okay, let's make this happen. So I was just curious whether it was very easy to convince those uh, to go for this new direction f with the new models. Thanks. I think probably Stefan can also elaborate quite a bit on this question. I think it's 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 part of it that um, like we have we have actually the cantons which act as both data collectors and data providers, and therefore they were interested in sponsoring for data collection and acquisition a tool and investing into it whereas they know very well the pot they, that they are required to get and aggregate data themselves as well. Uh, in the cadastral survey, we use Interlist since 25, 25 years, so, but uh, nobody else used it for the last 25 years. So, uh, so it was kind of hard to convince the people, please use Interlist for all other stuff. So, but it's, it's, getting, it's getting better, better every day or every year. So. Okay, another question? So, but but it's, from, from my point of view, it's all about a good tool chain. Uh, we, we didn't have a good, uh, good tools for, for, the, for 20 years. Uh, and now we have open source tools which are really easy to use, etc. So uh, people can use it, can use the standards and can use Interlist. But 20 years ago, no, nobody could use Interlist. Uh, if he didn't spend uh, 20 or 30,000 francs for a, for a specific tool, so. Um, it's more of a, I'm more witness here. I've been involved in the Inspire uh, process in, in France uh, and I discovered the, the interlist process and what you said uh, is that the cantons are both uh, providers and collectors is a really strong point. In the Inspire process, we have several layers between collectors and the guys specifying, the guys implementing some TML, ETLs, in fact, and we had access to the sources of FME jobs, in fact, between this. And uh, there is a methodology uh, you have in Switzerland that we should uh, use, is that when you produce a standard, you have to go up to realizing a tool, a uh, data collection tool with the standard and adjust it until it works. And uh, I'd be interested to discuss with uh, Inspire people to how to improve the process in, uh, in Europe for this. Okay. You. Do you want to comment? Short, two words, three words. Um, yes, so if there is anyone here who is um, in familiar with Inspire and would like to discuss how to improve the situation there, and if there is even a problem, maybe you've all solved it on your side, <laughs> but if, if, if you see some, some interesting points to discuss, uh, I'm, I'm also happy I'll be around all week and then um, be also very happy to, to talk to you. Um. you I'm, so, I'm sorry, we're kind of running out of time, so... We'll just meet each other, huh? Yeah, five minutes to...
Yes. I need to change the room. And I need to announce that on Friday afternoon we'll have this wonderful presentation of Maya the beekeeper where you will see plenty of QGIS functionalities in um, Bolero room. I think it's close here. Yep. And um, you're all much invited to come there. It's an entertaining and quite interesting talk about QGIS features. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation.